the big issue, and I was going to say one of the biggest issues, but I decided to just say the big issue, because it's in everybody's face today, is that of gender confusion. Everybody is faced with that. The kids in the in the other room are faced with it. It's it's behind all kinds of trouble we see. And even if you don't even admit that you can see it, once we go through all this, oh yeah, it's behind all kinds of things. It's 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 a huge issue for today. And what this issue is basically, gender confusion is where people can supposedly pick their gender contrary to what God has already created them as, but they have a choice. And with this, they can get this so-called surgery to actually change true reality into someone's own reality, as if there's no such thing as truth. Well, that's your truth, and this is my truth. And so this supposedly allows people to have the freedom to determine what truth is. And with this, there are supposedly many reasons for this desire. There's all kinds of psychology has looked at all these different things and all these reasons. But history has shown that basically one of the main factors or the main factor is related to perceived authority in self. Meaning that natural man and woman want to be in charge. And I would say that regardless of what psychology says, that the Bible teaches us that this is actually the truth. Even the pro-abortion people give the authority of a human life to a woman to decide, even if the human life was brought about through man and women. And today, authority has a lot to do with everyone's thinking because people hate authority. It's politically correct to say that a man can have, I'm sorry, it's politically incorrect to say that a man has any authority over a woman. And therefore, it's no wonder that confused men want to become a woman. Because that way they can regain the attention and the authority that they feel that they're neglected of as men. The women, look at the women. They're getting all the attention. They're getting all the authority. I want to be one of those. You can see how uh, women are uplifted in that position and men are weak men saying, I want to be like that. In the same way, we can see this. It's no wonder then that a woman may want to somehow become a man in order to receive some kind of authority in trying to look or act like a man. And the truth is, is we see that in this world that when women go ahead and play this game, we can see that their attitude is trying to throw their weight around and having authority. And so we can see that both of these things involving gender confusion have to do with fighting for authority. But it's nothing new. This gender confusion has been going on since the beginning, as we just read, which I will elaborate on in a minute. History has shown the inventions of false religions having a woman as their leader. It's just something that they have, that society has invented to feed this authority issue that they have. And today, we see even this. We see the false religion of environmentalism with Mother Nature as the goddess and her prophets and priests, the environmentalists. And it's all about her. It's all about Mother Nature. And we can say, yeah, that's ridiculous. But we also see it in the so-called Christian uh, religions that we see. This whole gender confusion. In 431 AD, the Roman Catholic Church acknowledged that Mary is actually the mother of God himself. Uh, we know she's the mother of Jesus. But they acknowledge that he, she's actually the mother of God. 
leading them to then pray to her in 600 AD. And by the time, and calling her, by the time 1965 comes around, she is considered the mother of the church as she leads her priesthood and they submit to her as the head of the church. That's what we see. We see them even showing Jesus as still on the cross, submitting to his mother, just like the priests. And we see the same thing in the so-called churches today, allowing women to be the pastors and the preachers. It's the same thing that started in the beginning. And the Bible describes this, women, this particular women leadership that we've been seeing here in this passage, in this message so far, that this uh, women leadership in the name of Christianity is actually an abomination to him. The Bible shows us this. We see this in Numbers 12. Moses' sister attempted to partner with Moses as an equal in leadership, claiming that uh, they were both equal in authority, and we saw the results of that. It didn't go well for her. God was very angry. We see this in 1 Kings 16. King Ahab yielding spiritual control to his pagan wife Jezebel, who let the whole world, uh, nation of Israel just head down to a crash. God was very angry with this. Even the name Jezebel is used to describe a woman misleading the church um, during the tribulation. I'm sorry, before the tribulation period, um, in, in Revelation, he was describing uh, at the time, which was 2,000 years ago, that there was a church with a woman uh, that he described as Jezebel. It might not have been her name, but she was acting as a Jezebel, misleading people. And God was scolding the men for allowing her to have the authority over them. This is in Revelation 2.20. And in the tribulation period, we see in chapter 17 of Revelation that at the end, during the tribulation time, the great false religion will be run by basically the great harlot, whoever that is. And so we can see that this is all anti-Christ. And <laughs> with this, this gender confusion and role reversal goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible that we just read earlier, whereas Adam allowed Eve to switch roles. There was gender confusion and role reversal then. And this gender confusion and role reversal is the cause of the world's problems today. It's a big deal. It's huge. It's underneath everything. I don't even need to talk about uh, the reason for uh, why we should vote for this particular president or that particular president. It's, all be, it's already there, and everything I'm talking about, everything we preach about all the time, points to uh, what we're go what's going on in our world and what is trying to be asserted towards us. And the good news is the Bible shows us the truth of God's intention for gender roles in his creation. He gives us what we need so we're not confused. We don't have to be gender confused, and we're not allowed to be gender confused. God has the right to call the shots. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. He created everything. He, the earth is the Lord's, and all it contains, the world and all those that dwell in it, Psalm 24.1, he owns. He created, he owns, he calls the shots. And so to, recently we've been studying through Titus's book on uh, a letter to Timothy, I'm sorry, Titus, Paul's letter to Titus, whereas he's um, describing what the conduct of the church should be. And he's gone through uh, selecting elders and what men and women are to look like. We saw last time, or the last few times, actually, I think it's been five or six, uh, the characteristics of godly men. And today we're going to look at the characteristics of godly women, according to to what the Bible says. Therefore, the Bible determines what a godly woman looks like. And so in this section today, Titus 2, 3 through 5, shows two examples of the character of godly women so that you may recognize, appreciate, and or learn from and be one yourself if you're a woman. Everyone needs to understand these things. Men need to understand and recognize and appreciate a godly woman. And a woman, all women need to learn and be a godly woman. So let's read Titus 2, 3 through 5. 
Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may instruct the young women in sensibility to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be slandered. Some of your versions say blaspheme, and we will go over that. And so we see these two characteristics of godly women. The first we see is the conduct of godly older women. Verse 3, the older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor slave to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may instruct, so that they may instruct the young women in sensibility. And it says the older women likewise. In other words, he just finished describing the older men. And so there's a lot of characteristics with older people that, that, that go across the genders as far as just general things. And, and we can see that the first one that we see, uh, basically the one that really relates back to the men is uh, likewise are to be reverent in their behavior. We see that men and women are to be reverent in their behavior. And it basically says that older men and older women should be reverent. We saw this in, uh, in Titus 2, 1 and 2 earlier in the last few weeks. And with this, older women, though, should be honored as mothers. Exodus twenty twelve and beyond. Therefore, if they are or need to be rebuked on these things, it must be in an honorable manner. 1 Timothy 5, 2 tells us that. They are to be reverent in their behavior, meaning suited for sacred character and service. Priest-like is the general um, way of describing what uh, the attitude of reverence that God had for the priests, and which means um, this is, like I said, a neutral gender command to be reverent. Befitting of a holy person. That's what reverent means. And with this, they have a special place in ministry as having experience and many maybe widows, as we see in the Bible. They're the ones that have had experience and are therefore needing to pass it on. And back in the day, these reverent women, the history tells us, were involved in rescuing abandoned babies who were left just out on the streets to die, and that they would rescue these babies and protect them from potential slavery and even prostitution and other abuses. That's what these reverent women were known for. Another example of a reverent woman was the prophetess who noticed and encouraged Joseph and Mary when they saw them bringing the baby Jesus to the temple for the first time. She was known as a widow, Luke 2.36 tells us, who never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. She was an example of a reverent woman who had been a widow and had served her household well and was now an example to others. Paul gives another view of what a reverent woman should look like. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 11. He says that they adorn themselves with proper clothing, with modesty and self-restraint, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly clothing, but rather by means of good works, as is proper of a woman professing godliness. And we know that this is not saying you can't wear any gold or you can't have your hair braided. The point was, is that these describe the women that were more concerned about that than being reverent, is what he's talking about. So don't get, we don't need everybody emptying out of here and thinking they need to go home and change. Um, but these are very important as the priority is reverence, is the priority here. Number three, we're still on verse three, I should say. Not malicious gossips. Not malicious gossips, meaning backbiting, slanderous as an adversary or an enemy of someone in the way you speak about them. The other word used to describe them is an accuser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? Where does this come from? The term for malicious gossip comes from the root of the term devil. Wow. Therefore, they are those who are working for Satan in their speech. John 8, 44. Wow. 
I, he is saying that women, and he's saying women, and he's saying women, and he doesn't say it about men. We know what can happen with men, but he's hitting it hard, really hard, and he's he's accusing them of being. He's accusing them, and not false ac accusations of saying, you know, when you do that, you're working for the devil. In fact, you're even called one of his when you're doing it. That's what malicious gossip really is in the Greek. Ouch, ouch. Wives of elders or even deaconesses are not to be malicious gossips. We see that in uh, 1 Timothy 3.11. He talks about it's a disqualifier to be a malicious gossip. And we see from 1 Timothy 5.13 and 14 that the sin is more prevalent with women. We see it there too. Most of the time we see that term that is directed towards women. And if you think about this, as widows and empty nesters, maybe, they may be in the situation where they have more idle time to get in trouble. And we know that's a reality. Which then could be related to the next sin, being enslaved to much wine. Combined as, as speech is often not controlled when you're intoxicated by alcohol. So they can go hand in hand. We're aboard, let's all get together and let's talk. We can just see these things that could happen. And like I said, it, there are warnings against men being malicious gossips, but, but Paul hits it really hard. Then we get to this part. Not enslaved to much wine. That means enslaved and or being a drunkard. We know that that was a command also dealing with the men. We, everybody here knows that that that's, could be the case with men and women. And we covered this a few weeks ago in the sermon uh, for Titus 1.7. Uh, we talked about the details of being enslaved and being a drunkard. And what it shows is there's two aspects of the sin related to alcohol. One is being enslaved, and the other one is being a drunkard. There's two possibilities for alcohol being a sin in your life. With this, the first one then is that you're thinking maybe manipulated by alcohol while drinking it and having too much. We all know that. Like, that guy's drunk. He's acting like a fool. I mean, that's, that's common sense. That is being a drunkard. That is, that is having too much wine. But then the other part is enslaved. And that is where your thinking is being manipulated by alcohol when you're not drinking. What does that mean? Your, your mind is still altered even when you're not drinking. What does that mean? Because you're enslaved to it. It's if the craving causes you to sin to get it or sin when you don't get it. It's an idol. So the sins of alcohol include being enslaved by it and being drunk by it. Those are the two things that could happen with alcohol. And all of these are summed up if you want to read it, which you really should, because it hits it really hard and obvious and very, um, actually, it'll, it'll put a smile on your face <laughs> unless you're guilty of the fact of like, wow, this, this proverb nailed it, but I don't have time to read through the whole thing. So you got to read through it later. Proverb 23 29 through 35. It's on your notes. You have to go home and read it. Number three. I'm sorry, verse three again. Teaching what is good. And with this, the teaching for women in the church means that they are to teach other women and children. The teaching talked about here is that the women are to teach other women and children, but not men. They're not supposed to teach the men. 1 Timothy 2.11 to 15 talks about that. 1 Corinthians 14.34 on your notes. It's a big deal. And as you see, it has to do with the issue of gender confusion and role reversal. Teaching what is good, meaning what is wholesome, holy, holy, and godly. And these principles... And we're gonna, I'm going to mention this proverb because that's going to be another one that we're going to look at later. Proverbs 31 addresses pretty much everything we're talking about in a nutshell. And we'll get to that. With this, this teaching can only be initially accomplished and even started by the woman's credibility and example. If there's no credibility, how could she teach? We see the older women needs to be things so that, so that, so that means in order to, in order to be qualified, they have to show credibility 
in character of these traits. She must teach by example first so that she may then teach at a higher level. And as just as with men, this example of how she's doing with that, just as with the men, is validated by her work in the home. Just like men, what's going on in their house? And with this, then, the older women are to teach the young women on the additional subjects that we will see in a minute. And the teaching, like we talked about, is not intimately done by Titus. You can see Titus, uh, Paul is telling Titus to have the older women do it. Not you, Titus. Not the men, but by the women are supposed to teach in these things intimately and with detail. We know that. That's the whole purpose we do the Titus to women's ministry. There's only women there. And obviously, uh, we, women can be taught by men in the setting we have here or in Bible studies, corporate times. But the uh, one-on-one with a man and woman that's not, that, that aren't married, nope. We got to be, when we know, we went through all the reasons for that, and it's just a done deal. Therefore, women that are put in the place, in place in the church must be qualified just as elders, wives, and deaconesses in 1 Timothy 3. And therefore, that is the conduct and characteristics and attitude of the older women. Now, now we see the conduct of the younger women. This is the command for them, what to teach them. Four, chapter, I mean, verse four, halfway through now. So that they may instruct the young women in sensibility to love their husbands. We'll start out with that. To love their husbands. And this comes, this love here comes from the Greek term phileo. Normally, when we see the word love in the Bible, we see it in the agape or agape form of the Greek, which is the love that describes an unconditional love, wanting what's best for the other person, regardless of how attracted you are to them or how good they cook or anything else. This phileo love is actually affectionate love where you have, an, it's an affection that you have for them. And, and hopefully that affection will get pay, help you to pay attention more to your agape love towards them. But they're different. The English language has put these three, um, these three terms that are in the Greek, agape, phileo, and eros love together and just called it love. But in, in Greek, when we untangle it, we can see that, that they have really a lot, a lot different meanings. So this right here to love their husbands is actually the phileo love that they are to have. It's what we would call the brotherly love. We see that in Romans 12, 10. The city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. It comes from the word phileo. And it's the brotherly love. It's the affection. It's what we're going to enjoy at the potluck later. It's the affection for one another. And it means then if a woman is to love their husbands, it means to cultivate and grow an affection towards them. <laughs> and the opposite of this is seen with King David. <laughs> King David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to the city, and he was excited, and he was outside dancing with excitement, praising the Lord. And we know that praise um, and worship of the Lord um, can involve uh, loud music, and loud uh, trumpets and cymbals, tambourines, and even dancing, we see that. But his his wife, Mikal, looked out the window, and and she didn't like it. She didn't like it. This is Second Samuel six sixteen. You can see it. She despised him in her heart, which is the opposite of loving him. She despised him. First Chronicles fifteen twenty nine, and it says that she despised her. We don't see anything for about five or six more verses. And then we see this in verse 23. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. She did not love her husband. She despised her husband. And she was just, poof, out of the picture and never had kids. Wow. And this bitterness ruins marriages. This bitterness ruins marriages. 
Proverbs 12, 4 says this, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes him shame is like rottenness to his bones. The wife's love for her husband is going to help him move ahead or not. And we know that all these things, um, we know that there's a lot of things we're talking about flip over to where the husbands need to make sure they love their wives. We, we, we go over this all the time and we will continue to. But in this particular passage, it's talking about how the wives can really mess up their marriage if they don't love their husbands. The young women are to love their husbands, and this love is cultivated through God's design for marriage. Because God designed us to love each other, and including the mutual blessings of intimate sexual activity of 1 Corinthians 7. That's included in all this. It means the whole reason you got together with your wife and vice versa is because you had an attra- a God-given attraction to them, and that God-given attraction is supposed to be there still. So it needs to be cultivated. And we'll see again, <laughs> the examples of the love of a wife towards her husband are also seen in Proverbs 31. We're going to see these things later on, but this is, when, if you get home and you say, I can't keep up all these notes. Oh, I do remember Proverbs 31. Then just read that. It'll help you. And by the way, Proverbs 31, as we get to it, I'm getting you guys all ready to hear it. It was written to a young man named Lemuel by his mother on helping him what to look for in a good wife, just to let you know. It's in, and so, therefore, it's instruction for the women. Well, that's what uh, Solomon's mother, is, which is a nickname Lemuel, we believe, is saying this is what to look out for. Um, it, it means that that's biblical, and that means it's what we should be looking out for, and it means what the women should be presenting themselves as. as. If she despises her husband, it'll cause problems. This love, then, towards their husbands is needed. (laughs) See if you can get this or not. This love for your husbands is needed for you to accept and live according to the upcoming and often difficult command to be subject to your husband. If the woman despises her husband, it will be impossible for her to follow his lead. So we need to get this part first, but it's important to get here first. Then verse 4b. Now keep in mind, remember, the older women are to teach the younger women these things. Keep in mind, all of this is that the older women are to teach the women, the younger women in these things. Verse 4, again, to love their children, meaning to develop an affection for them also. Paul had written to Timothy about this, about women leading men that's what they wanted to do, according to at the time when he wrote this. Paul says this. I'm sorry, he went back to Genesis 3 where Eve tried to lead and it was disastrous. So he goes back to that and then he gets back to 1 Timothy 2.11 and he, he says, therefore, basically, she is not to have authority over the man, but she will be saved through the bearing of children. And we see that it was mentioned in three, seven, uh, Genesis 3.16. Paul talks about it. And with this, let's correct this whole thing. In other words, having children doesn't save a woman. Let's get this right. But it shows that her role is the one that's primarily raising the children if you have them. Very simple to digest this. Or, or helping others. <laughs> Holding the little babies. All these wonderful things we see. People coming alongside and women helping women in these things. With this, if a woman does not love her children, it will be impossible for them to provide their spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. Why? Because kids are kind of difficult. If you don't have an affection for your kids, uh, let's just face it this way. We talked about the reverent women. What were they doing? They were uh, picking up abandoned babies left on the street. Why? Because their mothers didn't love them. And we think, how could that happen? And then all of a sudden you get a newborn or a young one in the middle of the night and you start reading these things and go, wow, if I didn't love this baby, I mean, this baby's irritating or, or whatever it is. Let's just all face it. And let's just look at yourself first as you were as a kid 
thank God that, that your parents loved you so that they didn't leave you out somewhere. So you have to love your children in order. How, how else are you going to meet their spiritual, physical needs or demands in some case? Oh, man, all kinds of things coming out of this one. <laughs> Just in the same way, it's impossible for a woman to submit to her husband if she can't stand them. In the same way, it's impossible for you to, love, to, to nurture your children if you don't love them. This is what the older women are to teach the younger women. Verse 5, to be sensible, meaning prudent. Therefore, sober thinking, planning, and strategizing things. That's what sensible means. It's like before we do anything, let's, let's run through the look at the big picture here. 1 Timothy 3, 2 and beyond, he talks about that. Being sensible then reflects self-control of the attitude, thoughts, and judgment. Having and exercising discernment and wisdom. It means before you even open your mouth or do something with your hands or walk somewhere with your feet, that you're already going, wait, 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 wait a minute. What do we have here? That's what sensible means. The next one in verse 5 also, to be pure. This means innocent. Another example of being pure is being innocent. 2 Corinthians 7.11 Talks gives us seven things that we can see in repentance. The marks of repentance. The sermon title is Evidence of Innocence. Paul said that he recognized these seven things in the repentance of some of the people in the church of Corinth. And he said, therefore, since I see these things, they're demonstrating the fruit of repentance, of, of repentance and I can see that they're innocent now. That is what pure means, being innocent. It means chaste, discreet, and modest. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but this section is related to this a little more directly. Your adornment must not only be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry, putting on garments, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible quality of a lowly and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. It's the attitude of being clean and pure inside that comes out no matter what you're wearing. People go, wow, that woman is beautiful by her godliness. Yeah, but she's 99 years old. I know. And that woman is beautiful. Why? Because we see what's in, within her. She is pure and innocent. Verse 5 also. Here we go. <laughs> Workers at home. Workers at home. 1 Timothy 5.13, the section on widows again. Talking about not being idle, busy bodies. Workers means, really easy in the Greek, it's, it, it, I had to do a whole word study on it. I'm just kidding. It means work. <laughs> it means being busy at home rather than being busy bodies at everybody else's home. Younger women are, and older women are not to be busy bodies, but they are to recognize the priority here. To carry out household duties, responsibilities, Therefore, balancing priorities all according to her role. Her role. Why are you over there disrupting their life when your life is a disaster? That's what Paul talks about. He talks about in this section, and I've referred to 1 Timothy 5 a lot, because he talks about widows. And he talks about people that appear to be widows, but they're really not. Why? Because they should be, they're not acting like widows. They're uh, in everybody else's business. They're causing trouble. They might be drinking too much. They might be malicious gossips, but overall, women need to understand this priority. And as we said, we will see this again in a minute in Proverbs 31. With this, by her recognizing her role and not being bitter towards her husband or the role, she will be blessed by being trusted by her husband and even protected from her wandering around to places she shouldn't go. What? We see Proverbs 7, the adulteress is the one whose feet are never at home. She's out after dark looking for this young man. It says her feet never stay at home. It's the opposite here is a godly woman recognizes this, and she's her husband's away, and she's wandering around getting into trouble and sinning and even causing other people to stumble. 
very important to, to think about this. And this is something that's very important, and I'll bring it up because it's, it's, it's right in her face. This is difficult then for Christian girls going to college. Let's just look at the ramifications. If we want to be sensible, it's okay, but we have to think about these things. Because if they're going for a career outside the home, even if their desire is to be a woman and be in their home, it could mean where if you think about their parents investing all this into their college, all this into their career, and with this, this career offers that it's supposedly much more than just being inside the home. And imagine the math, do the math on a young lady whose father and mother have put all this money into their college, and now the woman says, I want to get married and be at home. Imagine the conflict that she's going to go through. Think about these things. There's nothing wrong with women going to college. There's a, a Christian college that we, uh, that we participate with in, in our doctrine and all these things. But it's just something to think about overall. This is being sensible, thinking about the big picture. Number five, the word, uh, verse five, <clears throat> the word is kind. Now, <clears throat> I will tell you, I think everybody here knows the term, uh, the word kind. In the Greek, however, but first of all, I think most of the English translations use the word kind. But in the Greek, it actually means good. So I'm going to give that description. Uh, of course, we should all be kind. But I just want to tell you that in the Greek, it actually means good. And it means having a high standard of worth and merit, beneficial and acceptable to God. That's what she needs to be. So we know she needs to be kind to other people. But this, this section here talks about that she needs to actually be good, having a high standard of worth of things. Uh, and, and having a high standard of merit, that, she's, that she does things that are beneficial. She does things and thinks things that are acceptable to God. So just to clarify that, that's in Acts 9.36, the same term used in Romans 8.29, and it has to do with the things that are good, pleasant, holy, wholesome, those things. Verse 5, again, be subject, being subject to their own husbands. And the word subject is like, well, that, I mean, does it really say subject? What I mean isn't... Did, they, did Paul use a different word? I mean, is there a different word that makes it a little softer? Because this whole subject thing and being submissive is pretty harsh. So, so I'm here to tell you when, you when you research the Greek, the same term used here for subject is this. It's a military term. That gets everybody's attention. Meaning to place or rank under, to be, subjection, to be in subjection and to obey. And this is all according to the Abbott Smith Greek lexicon and beyond. Everywhere I looked, it's the same term uh, for these passages I'm going to show you to so that you really get the gist of what this means because this term being subject to has been tweaked. Why? Because people don't like that word. The, you notice the word subject to has the same uh, basic meaning as the word authority. Okay, so, so people don't like that, but this is what it says. Throughout the Bible. And in fact, what it does is it forces you that you can't just take this part out of the Bible because it's everywhere else. The same term used for subjection is seen throughout the Bible. Je just as Jesus did with his own parents. Luke 2.51. As the demons were subject to the disciples back in the day in, at one point in Luke 10.17. Just as everything is subject to Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, citizens are to be subject to the government, Romans 13, 1, just as the women in the church are to be subject or subject themselves to the law rather than them coming up with their own law, we learn from 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 14, 34, just as a slave is to masters. Oh, man, that, that's politically incorrect. It's the same term, subjection or subject. Young men to elders, 1 Peter 5, and us to God, James 4, 7. And therefore, the same Greek term is used to describe wives being subject to their husband. It either is or it isn't. It is. It's just what it says. It's just very difficult for the natural woman from way back in Genesis 3. 
This is very difficult. Society hates it. That's why there's a big difference between society and the church. And the best understanding and where you can really grasp that anybody in this room says this rubs me wrong, we'll go back and, and explain how it rubs everybody wrong. Well, all the women anyway. We're going to explain this. The best understanding then is to go back, back, back as we did earlier to Genesis 3. But we're going to start in this description in Genesis 4. So the best understanding is to first get a grasp on two terms, Hebrew terms that we can all relate to. We can all understand it as we see it in its context and the biblical illustration we get out of Genesis 4, and you'll see. So Genesis 4, Adam and Eve had two sons, Abel and Cain. Abel provided God with a sacrifice that God accepted. Cain provided God a sacrifice that God did not accept. Cain was mad. Everybody knows the story, what happened in the end. Cain ended up murdering Abel. Everybody has heard this story. With this, before he murdered him, Cain became angry, so God warned him of this. Genesis 4, 7. Sin is lying at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must rule over it. Sin's desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Now, everybody in this room can get that. Every single day we know sin's desires to, uh, to master us, but we must rule over it. Here, the term desire is obvious as it means to master over something. Here also, the term rule is obvious. It means to overcome that which is attempting to master you. So as you rule over sin that is trying to rule over you, you're going to push back against the, the, the attack. That's the term rule. Now, these same terms clearly explain the difficulty we see today in marriage. Why? Because these first two exact terms were used in Genesis 3.16. And it started because of the sin of Adam and Eve in their role reversals. And this is what God said after this, after their sin, that this is what they would have to deal with. Chapter 3 of the Bible, God said the consequences of not obeying him would be an ongoing struggle for mankind between men and women. So it's not just you, it's not just your marriage, not just your family, not just people you know. It has been, it's an ongoing for all mankind. This is what it says. This is what it says. You'll see the same Hebrew terms for desire and rule in Genesis 3.16. To the woman, God said, your desire will be for your husband. What does desire mean? Well, we just read what it meant. And he will rule over you. Boom. In the same way that sin wants to master and rule over you, you must rule over it. It's called conflict. It's called ugly. It's called pain. With this, then, the woman would naturally want to master over the man, yet the man was to overcome that attempt, and instead he is to rule over her. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Yes, of course it does. You don't even need to cop out to it. Hence, the battle of the sexes. And with this, the Bible is in direct conflict with the world, therefore a major problem for everyone going full circle back Gender confusion and role reversal is one of the biggest problems or the biggest problems we see. It's all about authority. And with this, this is what the Bible says, using the same term in Greek, uh, the same term as a military, a master and slave relationship, parents to children, Christ in the church. This is what it says, Ephesians 5.24. But just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in their, to their husbands in everything. Colossians 3.18, Wives, be subject to your husbands at his fitting in the Lord. Now, everybody says, well, that's just Paul speaking. We hate Paul because he hates women. Well, okay, let's see what Peter has to say in case you don't uh, agree with Paul because there's a lot of people that want Paul ripped out of the Bible. This is what Peter says. You wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, 
that messes everything up. Now it's 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 unconditional. Even if they're disobedient to the word, they may they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. First Peter three five. With this this unconditional subjection we see here, and it's regardless of the husband's status or behavior, and even if he's a Christian, because it says even if he's not, even if he's rebellious to the word. You're still supposed to do this. Ouch. First Peter 3, 1 and 2. And get this. It says to their own husbands. Peter wrote this. Paul's writing it here. Meaning their own husbands mean it's, it's the private property. Your husband is your private property. You own him. It's, you have the pink slip. Acts 4, 32. Uh, Romans 8, 32 uses this word talking about possession. And in the same way, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 2 to 4, talk about how and the wife is the husband's possession. We see that. And the reason for all of this, verse 5, is so that the word of God will not be slandered. The whole reason for this is to show that so that if the behavior is not there with the women, the Bible will be slandered. What does that mean? Slandered means to rail at, to revile, to speak lies about, and the word blasphemy. Every time you see the word blasphemy in the New Testament, it's the same word. And we see this word being used. It was the accusation that the Jews had against Jesus because he claimed to be God, and they said he's, he's dishonoring God, and therefore he's guilty of blasphemy. And we know that in Mark 3.28, this blasphemy is known as the unpardonable sin or unforgivable sin. Wow. Overall, this is pretty heavy. To speak lightly of or profanely of sacred things, especially impiously of God. That's what blasphemy means. And by your behavior, you could be doing that to the word of God. And this was the, uh, it's known as the unforgivable sin. We saw that in Mark 3.28. And in this case, this blasphemy can be done by Christians' behavior. And this term is used throughout Scripture. We see in Romans 2.24, Paul is talking about those by their behavior. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. you the way you guys are acting is that you're making, you're making God look bad. You're misrepresenting God. And, and we know that your relationship in, in your marriage, and this is uh, directed obviously to husbands too, is that if you don't model a Christian marriage in the same way that the, the, the church is subject to, the, to Christ and, and that Christ loves the church, then you are, op you are operating in blasphemy because you are giving the world a wrong message about what Christianity looks like and therefore you're a false teacher. This is, this is heavy. So it goes with the guys too. So all you guys trying to elbow your wives or anything else, it's all on all of us overall. It's all on all of us <laughs> overall. And what we see here is, is that it is, uh, we also see the other example in 1 Timothy 6.1. Slaves are to honor their masters. Why? So that the name of God and our doctrine will not be slandered. It's the name of God that's slandered and the doctrine. In other words, both are slandered. God himself looks foolish, and what he wrote in his Bible looks foolish. And who do you think wants that to happen? Satan, you know, the one that you're working for if you're doing that. And you're working for him then. That's the, that's the situation. This then causes the gospel to be maligned, criticized, and discredited by Non-Christians say, see, see, see. And with this, 1 Timothy 5.14 says, the, the, uh, the enemy has an opportunity for reviling. The enemy just says, see, look, see, look, see, look. Look at them, look at them. They're hypocrites, they're liars. And Paul is warning, warning about this. And look at this. Therefore, giving the natural fleshly desires of women, you know, the desire they have for freedom, from authority, it gives them the chance to see a misrepresented Christian marriage. Oh, well, uh, I can see that, uh, okay, I can see this Christian marriage and the women don't really have to submit to their husbands. And so they get a misrepresented 
uh, view. And then what it does is it gives them an opportunity to continue doing what they're doing because they think it's okay. And they don't need Christ because they're not in any sin. Can you see how bad this is and how you participate in other people going to hell? This is heavy stuff here. Leading to the whole acceptance of Mary leading the church and women preachers and pastors because women have demonstrated that it's okay. And then it, it's like the boiling frog. It gets worse and worse and worse in accepting of these things. Or, look, get this, and I know this sounds familiar to everybody here. On the other hand, making a Christian wife to look like a victim or a doormat by all her bitterness, complaining, and rebellion instead of what she should be is a new creation in Christ. So imagine this, is that you're also then showing people like those Christian women got a miserable marriage. Listen to her complaining. Look at her bitterness. She hates her husband. And why would I sign up for that? So you can see the damage this does with this bitterness, complaining, and rebellion against being subject to your husband. It just sends, it creates all kinds of problems. And as we saw earlier, this is also in 1 Peter 3, we read, it can hurt the, their testimony to their unbelieving husbands who see the misrepresentation of a Christian marriage and they don't see any benefit of the gospel. Like, why, why do I want to sign up for what she's doing? That doesn't do anything for me. Or your unbelieving husband could say, wow, you know, you're different than all the other women. And you keep saying, yep, yep. Can you see? Can you see? What, if you were to read, uh, let me say this. Let's start out with the men. If you were to read 1 Corinthians 7 and a whole bunch of other, including Proverbs 31, to, uh, to men out in the streets, and you would say, is this the kind of wife you'd want? And they'd all say, yep. And if you read uh, Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 to any woman and say, is this the kind of husband you want? And they'd say, yep. So, but instead, you're misrepresenting and you're causing Christianity to look ridiculous, stupid, hateful, everything else. It's, it's an amazing choice that God's given us the power to present to people. A woman who does not present a, ghostly, a godly marriage presents a fa false gospel to the watching world, and it blasphemes the name of Christ. So let's look at the opposite of this. The opposite of this, Philippians 2, uh, I'm sorry, start with Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your fathers in heaven, who's in heaven, say, wow, yeah, there's something going on there. Let that happen instead, Philippians 2.15, so that you will be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You know, the generation that's generally uh, gender confused, so that you may be different, you may be the light. Among them, you will then shine as lights in the world. 1 Peter 2.9, but... You, Christian women, are part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, so that you may proclaim Christ. So overall, this section, Titus 2, 3 through 5, shows us two examples of godly women so that you may recognize, appreciate and if you're a woman, learn from and be one. So we see the godly conduct of older women, which is to therefore be credible first as an example, and then to instruct the younger women in these things, but starting out with being an example. Then we see what they are to instruct the younger women with this. This is the conduct of the godly younger women through the example and instruction of the godly older women. They are to learn these things. So we're going to read... Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10. Right after uh, 30, before 32, which there isn't one. Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10. <coughs> this is the description of an excellent wife. An excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above pearls. The heart 
of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She deals bountifully with him for good and not evil all the days of her life. She searches for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar, and she rises up while it's still night. She gives food to her household and a portion to her young women. She makes plans for a field, and she buys it. From the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff, which is a spindle type of a thing, and her hands hold fast to the spindle. Verse 20, she extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hand to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. He sits with the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and gives belts to the tradesmen. Strength and majesty are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in, in wisdom, and the instruction of loving kindness that's on her tongue. She watches over the ways of her household, and she does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. As for, and as for her husband, he also praises her, saying, Many daughters have done excellently, but you have gone above them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears Yahweh, she shall be praised. Give to her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.